Well, welcome Dr. Cam to the podcast. I'm so happy that you're here. I'm thrilled to be here, Cheryl. This is going to be fun. Yeah, I always love talking to you and you have so much wisdom and we're going to talk all about like how to have these tough conversations with our kids when they're difficult, when there's conflict. Well, yeah. we're excited about summer that <laughs> has its challenges too. So you are considered the teen translator. Mm -hmm. so yep. How did you come upon, like fall in to becoming the teen translator? You know, it's one of those paths that go all over the place, but I'd always wanted to do psychology. Um, and when I was getting my PhD, I taught a class in adolescent psychology. And I had all these parents, because I taught an evening class, I had parents coming to me saying, oh my gosh, what you're teaching us in this class is completely changing our relationship with our own kids. I'm like, why don't people know this stuff? This is crazy. And I mean, I had my challenges as a teen as well. And it just, as people started learning that I knew stuff about teenagers, they started to ask me questions all the time. And I was like, I need to just do this as a living. And so that, it kind of just fell into that. And it's weird because I think you kind of get this calling and I, I your story might be very similar where I don't know why like this is just what I kept getting steered towards I love talking about it I love working with teenagers I, I love everything about it and it just it it's like it is what it is <laughs> I think that's what I'm supposed to be yes I feel the same way I I mean part of it came out of my own challenges and struggles with my oldest and I didn't know what I was doing when she was in middle school and having lots of conflict not wanting to go to school and I went on my own journey and that led to doing you know similar things but I love how you were talking about things that parents weren't hearing and what do you think some of the things were that they weren't hearing that you were sharing? It's the same thing that people are not hearing now. If we have this idea of what adolescence is going to be like, and it's not good, we don't paint a pretty picture for adolescence. And I've seen people with newborns going, oh, I'm going to appreciate this now because once they're a teen, it's all going to... And this is really frustrating because the more I start learning about adolescents, it is a different phase. They do see the world differently. They are learning a lot of the emotion regulation skills and the problem solving skills and decision making. So they're not great at it yet. But when we get past that layer, they're freaking amazing. They are so passionate. They're becoming their own selves. They're learning their own opinions and forming their opinions and just becoming these incredible human beings. And what happens though is because we expect it to be bad, we misread a lot of their behavior as difficult. We respond to it as though it's difficult. And then we end up having a relationship that's absolutely opposite of what they're craving and we're craving. And we as parents end up pushing them away and creating a lot of this disconnect, but we blame it on our teens because we were expecting it. And so when we understand that and when we change the way that we perceive adolescence and we approach it, it doesn't have to be this dramatic, chaotic period of time when you're disconnected. It just doesn't. And so that's what I keep trying to explain to people is once we understand what they're going through and how they view the world, we can adapt to how we approach them and it changes it all. Woohoo! I, like, <laughs> I know. I, I'm like, oh, that is so good. Um, I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking, gosh, you know, our parents, I think there was a whole other set of challenges in the way that we were raised. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on how this has come about because I don't think that my mom was as plugged into me as we are with our kids today. And I don't even know how many expectations there were put upon me. She wasn't seeing my grades. Uh, there, there just wasn't the amount of pressure. Now, I don't know if that was just me. What do you think about that? Do you think that it's more the way that we're leaning now 
I very much agree with you. The the thing that I see, and it's interesting to me when people, I hear this all the time, teenagers today, what's up with the youth? And I'm going, they're not changed. They're the same we were, but they're growing up in a different world and they're responding in a different way. And if we're going to look at anybody, it's how they're being <laughs> raised or educated or anything else, because that's the environment. And I, I'm not pointing blame at anyone. I'm saying the world is very, very different than it was when we were growing up. And you're absolutely right. The amount of expectations and pressures and the speed of it in the in, in the constancy, consistency of it, constancy, the consistency of it, it never lets up. And these kids are still trying to navigate the same things we had to navigate, but with a lot more pressure and speed. And they can't, they're not coping well. We're not coping well as parents either. So we're pushed so far. And so our ability and our patience is at a bit's last straw. We're comparing ourselves on social media just as much, if not more so than our kids, which is setting our expectations for ourselves and our kids. And so this pressure rolls down. And I will say, being able to see our kids' grades is probably one of the worst inventions for education ever, because it has removed the ownership from the kids and put it on the parents. And that is not teaching kids anything and is creating a lot of conflicts between kids and parents. I agree. I agree. And so much anxiety and pressure and nagging and terrible yeah and then we're writing them i'm so glad my mom couldn't see my grades <laughs> well because it changes all the time too and it's like it there's does. so much we don't understand about it and when my child and i'm not saying my child's a straight a student because she's not but when my child and she's 18 as she has taken ownership of her grades and she's learned to take ownership by not doing so great in some classes. And when I see her take ownership, that's when she's so motivated. I don't have to nag her to do her uh -huh. stuff because she's doing it for her and not for me. And that changes everything. And now when she goes off to college, I, I trust her and know that she's got the skills and the motivation and everything she needs to succeed there because she's not dependent on me at all. Yeah, she's not depending upon you to try and make her, you know, get her motivated. Not at all. Not at all. And so, that doesn't mean she's always been motivated. There's been periods of time where she hasn't been. And I have not jumped in to do it or push her for it. It's more about having the conversations about what is not motivating her, why she doesn't feel motivated and helping her get through that and looking at what does she want long term and what does she need to do that? And that's what motivates her. I love that. So what do you think the message is that we need to remind ourselves of as moms are and caregivers are listening to this? That our job is not to mold or fix or change our kids. Our job is to be the best parent we can be for who our kids already are. They are not something that we create. They are their own individual, unique person. And we need to kind of separate that. I think a lot of times as parents, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to say our kids are a reflection or an extension of us. They are neither of those things. They are our they're our responsibility to care for them. It's our job to make sure that they feel loved and cherished and supported and valued and heard. We are not there to make them be or do the things we think they need to do. And when we get out of their way and let them become the fully who they are meant to be, that's when they shine and that's when they become something we could never have imagined for them. My job is to stay out of my daughter's way mm -hmm. and just cheer her on as she goes and explores who she is. Mm -hmm. What you're saying, it's so true. Having my kids, I have three that are older now. And the word that's coming to me is trust. Yeah. And when I was not trusting, especially my, my oldest, trusting her to do something or 
whatever, fill in the blank. It became the self-fulfilling prophecy. That's the crazy thing about it. Yes. And yeah. And when you talk about getting out of the way, you are trusting that she's going to learn, that she's going to grow, and that it's inside of her and she wants to do well. And she believes in herself, which is the biggest thing. She has confidence that she can figure it out. And this is the one thing I see a lack of in a lot of kids these days is there's a lot of anxiety because they don't know or believe they're going to be able to handle whatever comes their way. They're not confident in their ability to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we, the only way to create that confidence is to trust that they're going to do their best. And even if they don't succeed at it, even if they fail miserably, that's okay because we're going to get through that. That's fine. There's always going to be things that we don't succeed at. We've got to be okay with that when they're younger and let them know it's okay and let them be able to do it on their own terms and then just help them learn how to get through it. Yeah. It's amazing when they have that confidence in themselves. It is. And that the sky is not going to fall. It's not going to be the end of the world. They're going to be okay. Yeah, that's what we have to convince ourselves of. Yes. But the thing I think that gets in our way as parents um, a lot is our own fear. Yes. And I am not saying that a lot of this fear is not, there's there's reason for a lot of this fear. There's definitely things to fear out there. But what I see is we end up reining them in so much because of our fears that we completely stifle their ability. And I talk to a lot of kids that feel caged in. Mm -hmm. like that's how they describe it. They're caged in and all they want is to be free. And so they end up being very rebellious. They end up closing off from us. They're counting down the days to get out of the house so they can just be without someone constantly kind of creating. And we do it with the right intent. None of these parents are malicious. They're all loving, caring, wanting the best for their kids. But because of this fear, we end up wrapping them up in bubble wrap a little bit. And they don't learn to take the bumps. They don't learn and trust themselves to be able to do it. They feel fragile. And that's not what we want to send them out feeling. Yes. And that fear it creates our our need to want to control things. Oh, big time. And then they rebel. Oh, yeah. Who wouldn't? They're human beings. Human yeah. beings do not like to be controlled. And so, yes, yes, we so, don't want to be controlled. Them to not push back when we're controlling, to me, doesn't make any sense at all. Like, how are we expecting them to be humans and develop their own sense of identity if we're telling them what to do, when to do it, how to do it all the time, and then getting mad at them for not doing that. We're creating someone that can't think on their own and is learning that compliance is the best way forward. And I don't want my child by any means not to go out to go out into the world and be compliant. I want her to be respectful. Mm -hmm. I want her to be able to understand and listen and be compassionate to other people, but I don't want her to be compliant to other people. Yeah, to have their own voice, to know what they like, what they don't like, to be able to say no. If you're compliant, a people pleaser, yeah, it's hard to have your own identity. And kids nowadays, they're looking outside of themselves all the time, like scanning, am I okay? Yeah. And what you're really talking about is like that internal confidence, which is very different. It is. And I think we're trying to create our kids to be accepted in the world. And I see this a lot. Um, a lot of parents vary. And I get this so much. Like I understand, again, it is that we want our kids to be successful. We want our kids to fit in. We want our kids to be treated well. But one of the things we don't often realize is when we're trying to change them to be acceptable, we're actually the ones being the bully and not accepting them. And so the message they're getting is that they're not okay the way they are. And I think as parents, we've got to sit back and go, this is the child that I have. 
This is the child. This is the child with their strengths and with their weaknesses, with the, with everything that they are. This is the child that I have and the adult they're becoming. How do I help them have the most confidence and be the best version of who they already are? Yes. It's so and, hard to do. You know, it is so hard to do. And I've been there. I get it. I was so fear driven with my oldest and I did not know until I knew better. And I thought I was doing all the right things. So for the mom that's listening and she's like, oh, I feel you, I hear you. And it's like, now I'm grateful that I went through that, even though I would have done it differently because I can hold out that hope. I see it now. And I see that it creates those very things that we really don't want for our kids. And it's never too late. It's never too late to okay. learn and to grow and to change. So what, what would be, uh, your, you know, your counsel to a mom that is struggling with fear? What would you say to her? I, I think the first thing is to say that fear is there for reasons because you love and cherish your child. I understand that. And that is wonderful. What I want to think about is let's go forward because right now you're trying to protect them from what could happen right now. And a lot of our fear is worst case scenario. Most of it will not happen. So I think we need to separate our fear from reality. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always the worst case. The other thing is what our ultimate goal is, is to have our child be able to protect themselves. And the longer we hold them in and rein them in because of our fear, the more we're preventing them from learning how to take care of themselves and be safe. We can't prevent everything from happening. It's not possible. We don't even know. So if we spend our whole lives trying to pre prevent every possible worst case scenario, we are wasting so much precious time that we could be spending connecting with our kids, taking care of ourselves, making sure that our kids are having that chance to explore and pull them up when they do fail because they're going to fall a lot. We're, we're wasting time worrying. And I don't want you to waste your child's entire, we don't, we have a lot of times with our kids. Like the majority of their life is not going to be under our roof. <laughs> Let's not waste that time worrying because worrying does nothing. It gives us this false sense of being productive when we're not doing a dang thing. Yeah. Just don't waste your time doing that and spend that time with your kid. The way that you put that, I am going to grab that quote. I've never heard anybody put it that way about when we're getting in the way and we're driven by that fear, our goal needs to be for them to be able to keep themselves safe. And if we're in the way, and I don't remember exactly how you put it, but if we're getting in the way, we're getting in the way of them learning how to do that. Yeah. That was like a wow moment, <laughs> the, the way that you verbalize that. Yeah. It, it's really difficult. But I, I think when we start switching that view, because we can start going, I am protecting my child by allowing my child to learn how to protect themselves. And mm -hmm. the only way for them to learn is to make mistakes. That's it. They're not going to learn from us telling them any more than we learn from our parents telling us, right? I'm still, I'm still learning from my mistakes. That's like, yeah, that, that's the best way to learn. It and is. so to deprive our kids of that opportunity now, it's, it's not fair. It's just not, yeah. it's not easy. I am mm -hmm. not at all. Oh my God, there's so many times, Cheryl, that I have held my breath going, okay, I'm letting my daughter do this. I got to trust in this experience. I got to trust. I got to trust. And it's terrifying. It It is. It is scary. And it's such a good discussion, though, because I think this is something we need to hear over and over again. And, and every phase of being a parent, my oldest is 33. I mean, there's always my youngest is 24. There's always new things that crop up. We're still the parent. It just looks very different. And that that being able to let go and remembering these things. I don't think that we can hear it enough because we're moms. We love our kids. 
We do. And I, I think we just have to refocus that energy. That energy and that, and that love is so essential, but we use it in a in an ineffective way that pushes our kids away. And mm -hmm. I just want people to think right now, how would you feel right now if your mom was calling you every day or dad was calling you every day, commenting on how you handled everything, giving you advice on how you should handle everything, showing you what you didn't do right. And you're like, but you don't have your life figured out. Why do you have the right to tell me? Same for us. We don't have our whole life figured out. We do not know better. Sorry, we don't. We just don't. So let your child figure it out and redirect that energy to support them, to love them, to cheer them on, to be there when they need picked up and to just listen and let them be heard and valued. That's what a parent is supposed to do, not control. Yes. Yes. So how can we begin? We've been doing the whole control thing. And you're talking about cheering them on, about hearing them, about listening. How do we how do we start that? You have a book on, I think you have like a thousand different ways to sit. Right. Yeah, the power of <laughs> yeah. yeah, This is great, but what do I actually say? You know, and, and yes. that was yes. a lot of things to get you started on every single topic because it is very difficult. But Honestly, the best thing that you can do is not say anything, just listen to what they say. Mm -hmm. And you will go so far in your relationship with them because they want to feel heard and they want to feel validated. And when they feel heard and validated, and let me be clear, we are not validating that we agree with their decision. We are not validating that we agree with how they're feeling or how they're expressing their feeling. We're validating that they are human and they have the right to feel and they feel that. And that is, we, that is, we can't control how they feel. <laughs> that is not anything that we can change. They're going to feel it. So we're validating that they have value and that their feelings matter. And then we go from there. And so when we hear them out and we listen to them, what we can do is just get curious and help them figure it out. And it's just going, so, you know, like, my daughter didn't do well on a test that she thought she would do really well on, right? And so the question just was, well, what, what do you think that sucks? First of all, I know how hard you work and I bet that's really disappointing to work that hard. And she's like, yeah, what do you think went wrong? What do you think didn't happen? Or what do you think you could do differently next time? Because, and so it gets to, a, there's no judgment. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. We, we really struggle to take judgment out. There's no judgment or criticism. It's curiosity. Wow, I wonder what happened because I know. Now, I know that there were ways she could have studied better. Of course I knew that. That's not for me to say though. That's for her to figure out and for me to help her learn to figure that out. If she wants my opinion and wants ideas on how to figure out, I am more than willing to do that. And I'll say, I'm here if you want me to help you study or you want to do you know, I have some ideas on just doing some flashcards or whatever it is. If you want to go old school, I'm here. But how do you, what do you think you could do? And she figures it out and she does it and she feels great because she mm -hmm. figured it out and she's motivated to do that because she figured it out. And if you tell them it doesn't work, that's no. usually when they, you get the pushback. Cheryl, this is my philosophy. If you Take a good solution for yourself by saying, I think you should do this. You have now taken that solution off the table. So if you want your child to make a good choice or to make that choice, do not claim it for your own because now they, that's the last thing they're going to want to do. Why? Not because they're being disrespectful, not because they're being difficult, because it is so important for them to think on their own and be independent and come up with that idea so they feel confident. That's why. Yeah, it's like we rob them of that taking ownership and yeah. coming up with it themselves. Yeah. If we take, yeah, gone. gone. Yep. Or we t are they tweak it? It might look a little different, but it fits better for them. Our suggestions a lot of the time don't work for them. 
A hundred percent. We're like, that works for us. And often we're solving for our problem in the situation, not their problem, right? So we're solving for, I need to know you're doing your homework or I, I need to know this rather than what is it that's getting in their way of doing their homework? We got to solve for that. Yeah. I remember the first time hearing the phrase unsolicited advice. Mm. And that was so good. That was like one of those bing moments yeah. for me. Like yeah. don't give unsolicited advice. They're not asking for it. So shut up. Yeah. And I still sometimes <laughs> come out with something and they'll be like, now they know, mom, you're giving me unsolicited advice. I'll be like, okay. Oh yeah. You're right. You're right. Versus, do you want to know my thoughts? You know, yeah. after they share their feelings. Yeah. Would you Absolutely. like to know? Yep. And I, yeah. I think what's hard is we as parents often feel like we have the right to give them advice. Um, and or we're doing it because we want to help. We sincerely want to help. And we're our advice giving is in their best interest. The problem is it's not received that way. It's received as being controlling, even if it's the best advice ever. It's received as that. And it's also received as overstepping their boundaries. So if they say, I don't want to know, and we don't respect that, we're teaching them disrespect of boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So important. They've got boundaries that we need to respect too. And that's how they learn to respect ours. It, it is. We're modeling that for them. And then they learn to respect other people's boundaries and they learn to respect themselves if somebody else is crossing over their boundaries. Yeah. They need to know how to protect their own boundaries. And I've talked to a lot of kids who, again, not because their parents are malicious, but they don't have the ability to say no at home. And they go out into the real world and they've been put into really bad situations where they did not feel safe or powerful enough to say no in those situations because they didn't know they could say no. And that is something we've got to realize that our kids, if we want them to learn how to have a voice and say no, they've got to be able to say no at home. Yep. And they have to be able to strengthen that muscle to yeah. practice. Yeah. We, it's our job to teach them how to do it respectfully. Mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. they don't know how, and they will often say it in a way that's extraordinarily disrespectful, but we need to get past that and go, we, want to, we don't want to shut that down. We mm -hmm. want to go there and say, yeah, you have the right to say no, but let's tweak and teach you and let's try to rephrase how to say that in a way. So it's not through anger. It's through, again, I get, I hear that you don't want to do that. The way you're saying it, it's making me feel very disrespected, doesn't feel good. What is another way you can say that? Because I want that for you too. But when you say it that way, getting what you want probably won't happen. <laughs> so yeah. how do you say it in a way that might work for you, right? And now it's more about them and teaching them to be more effective rather than me being offended that they said it in a way that made me feel disrespected, even though that might not have even been close to what they were trying to do. And what a gift to give that to them. I'm thinking my mom didn't, you know, learn this either. And, um, it would have been such a gift to learn how to be able to say things so that when I did go out in the real world, I had exercised that no muscle where I could say no to something at my work. I mean, I didn't know how to do that. And when I was being disrespected at work, I would say, no, that isn't going to work for me. Yeah, I, I didn't either. And I, I think that's a generational thing too, but mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. passed on some generation and we know better now. And this is not about saying, oh, they get to say no to everything and they get to walk all over this us. That's not it. We still, we still say no, we're still the parent. We still have guidelines, but it's giving them a little bit more freedom and it's giving them the benefit of the doubt that they're trying to communicate something and they're just not doing it well rather than they're trying to be a jerk. And so when we're able to teach them that, the other thing was, you know, I wasn't allowed to get angry that was seen as disrespectful. Mm -hmm. And so now to this day, when I'm angry, I cry and I hate it, but it's what I learned to do. And so I, now 
example, when I get really angry, I go into crying because that was okay. I, I am the same way. And I know you've seen the anger iceberg. I think there needs to be a sadness iceberg too, because I sadness was safe for me. So I would cry. And then I'm like, you know what? I, I think I'm angry yes. about this. And that actually propels me to say, okay, what do I need here? Yeah. Maybe something, there's a boundary that's, that's being crossed that I need to say, no, that's not okay. And so I'm the same way. I'm very much relating to you. And I really like how you said they haven't learned the skills yet. No. And so they don't know how to handle conflict responsibly. And we're still learning in many ways too. And what a, what a helpful way to reframe. Well, here's the other thing that I want parents to really realize is that they do not have the skills. However, their brain during adolescence is primed to learn these skills. So we always hear the brain's not fully developed till 25. That does not mean at 25, they suddenly have all these skills. That means that during this time up to 25, they are primed to learn these skills. So if we don't give them the opportunity to learn it then, and we wait till 25, now it's even harder for them to learn it. So we need to take advantage of this window of opportunity to teach our kids all of these complex skills that their brain is craving to learn. That I think adds a little bit of urgency into why we need to let them do it now. Yes. And that's hopeful too. <laughs> that Very hopeful. It's not just like their brain is, you know, it's all disconnected and things aren't, it's like, no, they can learn this now. The yeah, it's primed to learn. It's primed to learn. Our brains are never that. The, it is in a growth spurt and it is the biggest growth spurt our brain will ever go through except for an in infancy. It will never grow at that speed now. So they've got super brains. They really do. But it's up to us to help them develop those skills. And they're going to be terrible at them at first. They are. That's, that's <laughs> the way they learn. It's like riding a bike. You fall off a lot or learning to walk. You fall down a lot. You keep trying until they get it. And we might not do it, you know, or we're not, we might, we're not going to do it perfectly either, but just that, that our listeners want to learn and are listening is like, wow, yeah. what an amazing job that they want to learn. And they're listening here. Yeah. So, um, I, final closing words, and I want you to tell them where to fi find you. Yeah, so easy to find me. It's ask Dr. Cam, D R C A M um, dot com, and you can find everything. Or I'm on Instagram at Dr. Cam Caswell, C A S W E L L, and I'll give you that information. Um, and I do daily tips and everything on that on how to help to help raise your teens. Um, and I think the biggest part is is remember that parenting is a skill set and raising teens is a completely different skill set than raising a young child and so it is okay to ask for help it is okay not to know how to handle a situation because we haven't learned it yet just like our kids haven't learned how to do a lot of this stuff we're not necessarily we're going to make mistakes we're going to learn but the beautiful thing is you can learn you can continuously learn to be better at it. That doesn't mean you're horrible now. It means you can be better because it is a skill set like anything else. And you have to practice to get better. Yeah. And you have a membership also. We have a membership at Moms of Tweens and Teens, and you do also. And I love that because it's a place where you go to practice, to learn these things, because it is really difficult to change these patterns we have if we didn't learn it growing up, if we didn't have it modeled, and to be able to have a place like your membership, my membership, where you can go and you have other moms and you're working on these things and they have you to support them, me to support them. So tell them what it's called and you can share that information. I know that you are, you know, really um, doing a lot there. So tell them about that as well. Yeah, it's the Thriving Parent Academy and it's thrivingparent.org. 
And it is a group of us coming together. We actually have some dads too, but it is a group we meet regularly. I am there and we share what the wins, we share the struggles I have. It's so fun. I, two of the moms in there are like best friends and they will spend the, they'll go on their walks and they'll be like talking about stuff. And they'll be like, oh my God, what do you think Dr. Kim would say on this? What do you, they told me this. I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then there's things that are like, we still don't know. We're going to go ask her. And so they'll bring it up and all the other parents are like, oh my gosh, yes, I have had that same situation or here's what I did, or I'm so glad I'm not the only one. And so the feeling of being with other parents that are also dealing with the same challenges and realizing you're not alone in this. And believe mm -hmm. me, I have heard the same complaints and worries and concerns over and over and over again. And so what you're going through right now is, is yes, your situation is unique to you and your child, but in the gr grander scheme of things, it is not unique. It is a very common parent-teen dynamic. And that's what we help you through is how do you change that dynamic? And the beautiful thing is the power is ours to change it. When we change how we show up, it will change how they show up. Absolutely. Very true. Very true. And it starts with us. Yep. So thank you for having that academy. We need it. We need each other. We need that support. It makes a humongous difference. It does. Yeah. So thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Cam. I love talking to you. This was great. Thank you, Cheryl.